أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين صلاة Oh my goodness, if you were at workshop, I'd say your moms <coughs> haven't given you breakfast. <laughs> Can we have a salawat? Allahumma <laughs> salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That doesn't work for me. Okay, we'll start again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. I don't bite. I am not a scholar, I'm simply a mom. I've had 12 children, I've lost seven, I have five children, I have five grandchildren. Um, I love the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt, that's basically who I am. And I'd like to share my love with you. Like I said, I'm no scholar. And at 61, I don't take prisoners, I say it as it is. <laughs> okay. So the afternoon tea was titled Seeking Your Full Potential Through the Quran. So we're going to go through, you've got some, I think you've got some screens there that you can look at. And we're going to talk about what full potential is. It all started when I was telling my children, like I said, I've got five of these, all different. And when I tell them, you know what, when you get to Jannah, for God's sakes, wait, take me with you. And they would say, Ma, what do you pray for us? And I say, so you get to the door of Jannah. And they would tell me, ah, ah, Ma, that doesn't work. Can you pray that we go in? So this is where it all started. The, that full potential is actually going in here and in the here after. Okay, so let's have a look at how this works. So the f your full potential means the best you can be. And again, I will talk to you like I talk to my, my children. My students are like my children. So I believe that there's four aspects of your life. You've got a physical, you've got a mental, you've got an emotional, and you've got a spiritual. And in your mind, you have to have a goal. The Prophet said, when you ask for something, know it's at the door. So you've got to imagine you're 70. I'm 61. I'm nearly there, okay? So you've got to imagine you're 70 or 80. What would you want to look like? And I remember at one stage, I'd said Joan Collins to someone. I'm not talking about what she does. I'm talking about how she looks after herself physically. Or anybody physically. I mean, do you really want to have, in Stanmore, we have so many chairs at the back, and they're actually slowly impeaching on everybody else's places because people can't sit on the floor. Their knees are hurting too much. I don't want to be that. So to be able to reach my full potential physically, and that is the first bit, you have to go to the gym. Can't afford a gym? Go up and down the stairs. Go vacuum. Go do something. But look after yourself. Pray Salah. 100 rakats a night is phenomenal. Yoga, everything mixed up. And I'll talk about the spirituality later. Okay, you've got to eat well, and in my mind, you cannot eat better than the Prophet's diet. It's phenomenal. This five-two thing that I hear, the Prophet recommended ages ago. Fast two days in a week. Did he not say that? We have got Imam Rida's um, tib, as you call it, or the medicine, or his food. It's called Risalat al Zahabiyah, the the Risala that was written in gold. That tells you what to eat in every month, month from January to. December, eat healthily. Don't go on these fatty diets. You know, I hear about the, tell me about them. I don't know, you know them better, right? I hear so many, but there is no such thing as the Prophet's diet. If you are not well physically, you cannot do anything else. It just doesn't work. Mentally stimulate yourself. Okay, you wanna watch Pakistani plays? Go for it. But do something with your mind. Do something with it. Do crosswords, do word searches. I, I really don't know. Expand your thinking, because otherwise it's not going to work. The Prophet said, if in two days you're the same, then you've got an issue. If in three days you're the same, then maybe somebody else should be breathing the air you're breathing. That's how tough this is. You cannot just sit and say, you know what, that's it. Five kids, five grandkids, let me sit down and just tell the daughter-in-law to do anything. She's wonderful. Anyway, right, the third one, emotionally. My goodness, that is the hardest bit. To have this massive heart, to be able to forgive, to be able to get rid of resentment, to be able to get rid of hatred, to be able to have this big thing in here, that's not easy. But you have to strive towards it. It's definitely not easy. Nowhere in the Quran, and you can leaf through the pages, and I'm sure many of you have, nobody talks about, Allah doesn't talk about su success as the pursuit of happiness. It's contentment. And contentment comes with giving. That's not our 
our topic today. And then finally, spiritually. That's connecting to him. And the only way we can measure, and I believe in measurements, I don't believe in life. You have to have a benchmark. You need to be able to measure yourself. The only way you can measure your connectivity to him is how you have touched another life. And it really doesn't matter who, how, what. Did you pick up that, you know, the rubbish that was down there when you walked up the stairs? I remember one particular incident at workshop, which is the Saturday school we do. I remember one particular week, I came early and I took a packet of crisps and I actually spilt it on the stairs which led up to the nursery to the younger children. Okay. I actually spilt it on the stairs. After workshop was finished, when I went back, the crisps had been ground into the carpet. Not one person had picked something up. Yet at home, if I see a little string on my carpet, you know, a little bit of thread or something, I will pick it up. I'll pick up a dustpan and brush. And really, connection to him, the only benchmark is how you treat somebody else. Like Imam Ali says, live so people want to be with you. Die so that they cry for you. That's what it's all about. And here I've quoted Rumi. If you look at it, you might be able to read it. He says, you were born with potential. There was nothing like somebody saying, oh, you know what, I just can't get there because of this circumstance and that. It's nothing like that. Each one of us can be our best. You can shine up. He says, you're not born to crawl. You are born to fly. Nobody can stop you and me by flying. But we need to be able to want to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you and me so much, so much potential. We just need to find that. Right, next slide. Oh, maybe I can use this. Oh, there we go. So to me, this is what defines success. Problem is that we define success differently. Again, I'm going to tell you a story. So are you getting bored already? No, okay, you're not waiting for that tea yet. All right. <laughs> so imagine, imagine you're standing at a, at a road, a busy road, and near you, there's a suited, booted, Chanel, Armani guy, OK? They're quite cute, actually. Nothing wrong with them, OK? Good to be suited, booted. I used to be married to one of those. I still am, but he stopped doing that. So here we go, suited, booted. And then there is a, a garbage truck, a, a rubbish truck, and you've got the man who's picking up the rubbish. As you are looking at both of them, you cannot but deny that if somebody asks you who is more successful, you will pick the suited, booted guy. It's, it's human nature. And you know, don't lie. And, you know, you've got to be absolutely honest with that. But then you saw a, a woman with a pushchair crossing the road. And a car was coming really fast. And it was the guy who cleaned the dustbins who rushed to save that child. The suited booted guy just looked at his suit. Now if I asked you after that, who is the more successful one, I can guarantee you, you will say the guy who, the, the person who picked up the garbage. You had a paradigm shift because your humanity, your human nature, the divinity in you saw what was right and what was wrong. That's human beings. Now Allah in Surah Al-Asr, I don't think there is any surah in the Quran that matches this surah. And it's the shortest one. He actually defines what is divine success. And that is reaching our full potential. So if you look at Surah Al-Asr, even if you don't learn anything today, we will, be doing, we will look at Surah Al-Asr as our starting point the companions of the Prophet, when they met each other, when they left each other, they would recite Surah Al-Asr. It was like that was their definitive thing that defined who they were. You know, if you go into major companies today, I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist by profession many, many years ago. Hold on, I'm 61, married for 44 years, do the math, okay? So, <laughs> and I remember when I, w when I was working with companies, I used to work with Coots, and I remember the most money was spent in finding a mission statement that everybody from the doorkeeper to the manager would stick to. So you needed something that you could hold on to. To me, that is our mission statement, Surah Al-Asr. Okay? So let's have a look at what it says. It starts off by saying, you all know it. Can we recite it together? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wal Asr Inna Linsana Lafi Khasr Illa Ladina Amanu Amilu Salihati Watawasal Bil Haq Right, so well asked. When Allah swears, it's not because he wants to prove that it's true. He swears because he's trying to put something in our heads that's important. He's trying to tell me and you that what I'm swearing by is really important. Asr means to squeeze. 
And if you looked at the previous slide, that's literally Asr. Asr means, you know, when you, if you, many of you speak Arabic. So Asir is juice, right? So Asr is squeezing. It squeezes, time squeezes the dunya into the akhirah. The time of Asr squeezes the day into the night. In ancient times, people used to stop work at the time of Asr. So Asr is re really the end of a productive day. But if you look at the quote from Imam Ali, every breath is a step to the end of life. So Allah is swearing by time. It is the only commodity you and I have that is so very valuable. So he's swearing by it. Then he says, Innal insana lafi khusr. My goodness, it is such a s difficult statement to take, to swallow. Every human being is in loss. So he's made a blank statement. He didn't say Muslim, non-Muslim. He just said every human being, I'll, I'll paraphrase this, every human being who does not use their time properly, who does not have time management in their life, who is unable to recognize the value of time, is at loss. But he says, illa ladina. And there's two parts to this. The first part is individual responsibility. My first responsibility to myself is to wake up. Do I believe or don't I believe? Do I trust or don't I trust? And that comes at the most difficult times of your life. In easy times, life is easy. But in difficult times, do you trust in God or not? Do you say, well, I have done my best and I've handed it over to him and he will look after me. Do I do that or not? So I'm going to look at myself. So he says the first part of success is being secure. And when you're secure, you radiate that security to others. The only way to benchmark that belief is Amilus Salihat. Now, those of you who know Arabic know that good deeds is such a, I can't call it a bad translation. It's a different translation. Good in Arabic is khair, is it not? Sulh, from where Salihat comes, means to put two things together. So Amilus Salihat is first fix what is broken in you. Look inside you, fix what is broken. Do you hate? Are you jealous? Do you gossip? What do you do? Is there something in you that causes resentment? Start fixing that first and then help fixing somebody else. We're so quick to judge. You see how we judge? Oh my goodness. But there's one judge, position taken, when it's empty we'll all apply. We're somehow in this, you know, I don't know what bubble we live in. But this one says, inner and outer. That's my, sorry, the, the spelling's wrong there, that's me. Individual responsibility is belief, and Amila Salihat. But that doesn't connote success in Allah's eyes. He says you need people. Once you've do, done that, you have a collective responsibility. So I have a responsibility, you have a responsibility to be able to transmit reality to people. Do you watch X Factor? No, you don't. You're too good to watch X Factor, right? No, you don't? Okay. Maybe those of you who know about X Factor know it that sometimes people come on there whose parents have falsely told them how good they are. And they're awful. Nobody woke them up to reality that they're not good enough and they're made a laughing stock. So tawasso bil haq means to be able to counsel one another to reality, to truth, to purpose, to justice. Now that's tough. That's not easy. If somebody came up to you and said, do I look good in this? What do you say? You look different. <laughs> yeah, everybody has their own way. But if they're a good friend of yours, you might say maybe if you adjusted it slightly, it might work better for you. And that's where the Wasobis Sabr comes. To be able to give them strength, motivate, be able to tell them or give them the softer part of reality. And this is not something that is an optionality. This is how time should be spent, making myself better and then fixing other people or helping to fix other people, to raise somebody who's fallen, to be able to assist. That's what life's about. It's really not about ourselves only. It doesn't work otherwise. So that's what divine success looks like. That's what full potential looks like. It actually looks like someone who is out there for others too, besides themselves. And I'm gonna, before I go into the next slide, which we are here about Quran, 
um, I'm going to talk about a story that you might all have heard of. If you have, I'm sorry, but in Naf'at al-Dhikra, Quran says it is good to repeat something. So we have an amazing scholar called Allama Hilli. Anybody heard of him? You heard of him, haven't you? Child protege, phenomenal person. So he was, he was quite light-hearted. People always tell me, did the prophets and imams laugh? Did the companions laugh? Oh my God, they laughed a lot. Okay? It's about smiling. The first hadith of the prophet that my father taught me was smile. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, it's okay, it's okay, okay. Uh, so Allah Mahili had a friend, and they made a pact with each other. And they said, you know what? The first one who dies will come in the other person's dream and tell them what's happening down there. So, well, so, so happened that Allah Mahili dies. And he sees his friend doesn't see him for a long time. And then he comes in his dream and he says, what happened to you? I mean, you just disappeared. Were there lots of women up there? I mean, you know, what happened? I just went. He said, it's difficult trying to work out my whole life and account for it. I had to account for everything that was there. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay? Look it up. So he said, um, but that's Kiyama. I said, oh, I, I had to sort everything down there as well. So he said, what happened? He said, well, they told me, what did you bring from the world? And he said, did you see the amount of books I've written? He said, I mean, you all, you all know about Bihar and Noir, right? Like loads, oceans of light, written by hand. He used to stick his hair in a plait and then pin it to the wall so if sleep came over it would pull him back. That's how he wrote. He said, I said, look at the books I've written. And the angel said, what's on the cover? He said, my name. He said, well, people until the day of Qiyamah are going to remember you. No, 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 no. What did you do that made such a difference that you did solely, selflessly? He said, I can't remember anything. So there are two versions. I'll tell you the version I like. So he said, one day you were called by the Khalifa and they came in their old pomp and glory and they came to collect you in their carriages. And just as you were le leaving home, there was this annoying man who always asked you questions in the front of your house. And you saw him again and he said, I need to ask you a question. And you thought, he's going to be there when I come back anyway. But he said, just as you moved a little bit, you felt bad. So you came back and you made them all go back. And this is talking about at that time, the king's carriages, even today you have the same thing. You came back, you sat on the ground, and you answered his questions, and then you went. That is what God accepted. Now, if we can understand the level of what it is when it comes from here, of how we assist others, or how we make an impact to others, this is what really matters. Okay. So that, in essence, is reaching your full potential. When you can reach out to somebody else without wanting anything else, when we can, in within ourselves, heal ourselves and, you know, take these broken bits out, that's what full potential is all about. It's as simple as that, okay? Um, I'm not forgetting Salah and Psalm and Hajj and Zakat. That's all part of fiqh and, you know, that's all your soul food. So can we have a Salawat, please? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farad. So we're going to have the next... Um, the next presentation we're going to talk about the Quran. You can have a breather if you want while they put it on. So while this presentation is coming on, I was asked a little while ago how I came to do this. I was raised by a... Can I have a salawat please? Before they put this on, I'll just give you a little preamble. I was raised by a father who was phenomenal. I'm the eldest of four. My father used to be somebody, a very successful businessman, but he used to be the muazzin for the little town that we lived in. My father died when he was 38 of a penicillin injection reaction. I was 10, my younger sister was 2, and my mother tried to raise us, but we were sent out to various different relations, and the atmosphere that we grew up in was different from what my father had raised us, but the impact that he had on our lives um, was amazing. I got married to a very awesome man when I was 16. I turned 17 10 days <coughs> after I got married. My grandmother said, he can't even afford your talcum powder. But um, I'm still married, 44 years, and I'm still here. So he was awesome. 
many things happened in life, lots of things happened, and it was one of those difficult moments in life when you think, where do you turn to? And when you don't have a father, you want to turn to something that you know is definitive, that will not move its goalposts, that is not human. Something that will always be there. And I still remember that day. Maybe, I, you know, it's not something I share very often. But I was pregnant with my son. And something happened that, was, that wasn't something I could take too much. I was living in a place called Nairobi. I remember sitting in my bedroom and thinking, you know what, that's it. I don't want to live anymore. So I had uh, some, some painkillers. And I, you know, you read about this, how people take painkillers and end their life. So I looked at these painkillers, and I had a maid. Her name was Margaret, but she then, uh, I owe my life to her. So then she turned the name to Jamila. But anyway, Margaret came up and she said, and in Swahili, Mama Zara means mother of Zara. My oldest daughter is called Zara. She said, Mama Zara, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking at that. She said, Mama Zara, you know what? You kill yourself if you want. But that baby does not deserve to die. So Mama Zara, give me that baby when it's born, and then go do what the heaven you want with yourself. And that changed my life. And then I thought, you know what? You need something definitive in your life. And that definitive was Allah. And it was phenomenal. And then that book, that Quran was there, and you thought, oh my goodness. That's what you've been missing. That's a point you've been missing. The Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. And that's it. That just, there was a switch that turned on. And then as my children were growing, I couldn't trust them to a madrasa. Because as I looked at some of the teachings there, I thought, my goodness. They're not explaining to them why they're praying. They're so harsh with them. Read Quran or else, if you don't pray, you will go into Jahannam and you know, there will be snakes in your ground thinking, are you serious? That is not the love I know from my creator. So I decided to start my own school at home with the children and it just grew. Um, and that's basically how this happened. And this is where I am today. And that ended up into something called Q Fatima, which was again, a series of incidents where the See, being a woman, and most of you know that, in a male-orientated society or dominated society is quite difficult. So when you're part of their organizations, you have to comply, you didn't want to do that. And but we started our own organization, and that seems to have worked. How did Quran City come about, which you're seeing right now? The children had grown up. Like I said, I've got five children, ranging from 38 to 19. Um, the children grew up, and I remember once sitting in this shed and giving about everything away, except the Lego. And I was looking at this Lego and I'm thinking, I've been teaching for 30 years or more. And all I can do about the Quran is illustrate surahs. You know, you have surah al feel, everybody illustrates it. You have stories which we illustrate. But what about the rest of the Quran? I couldn't illustrate it. I didn't know what to do. And that Lego sort of maybe spoke to me. No, I'm not going psycho. It did speak to me. <laughs> and I used to love the eye of Quran, surah al tahrim eye 11. Rabbibni li indaka baytan fil. Jannah. Rab, build for me a house with you in Jannah. And I thought, Lego, Jannah. He's telling me to invest in real estate in Jannah. <laughs> Might not be Lego, but hey. <laughs> so we built a city and it just happened. Okay, so that is Quran City. So let's just look at how we started. So I'm going to, what we also did, and maybe some of you listened to this, is we do something called Q-Bytes. Every morning we do a podcast of three to four minutes. Problem is that we thought this would be only 20 or 50 um, people, but we now have 16 WhatsApp groups and we can't cope. So we now have an app called Qbytes. It will be launched in a few weeks. I'm sure I'll circulate it to Zara and she can circulate it to you. But let me show you the, I, I wanted to take you through the journey. Let me show you the introduction that we've done to it. I don't know Zara whether you can play that. You can probably play it from there. This is really a draft version of what we're going to put out, so you can understand where I come from. So I'm going to subject you to two minutes of, of a talk. What comes to mind when you mention the Qur'an? A book in Arabic with a range of translations, transliterations and complexities. For most Muslims, the Qur'an seems inaccessible and remote. Although all Muslims revere the Qur'an and believe it to be the word of divinity, many see the Qur'an like a software license. Not everybody actually reads it. They simply scroll to the bottom of the terms and click, I agree. 
The challenge was to make this wisdom accessible to all by translating it into the language we use every day and delivering it in a way to suit our busy lifestyles. Imagine if this was your starting point. That's where Q Bytes comes in. With daily podcasts covering different topics, Q Bytes allows us to comfortably navigate the Quran and shows you how to apply its teachings to your life. We've mapped the Quran as a city that we can guide you through with each podcast. The 114 chapters translating into 114 buildings, with the 6,236 verses placed into relevant subject flaws. Everything within context coming seamlessly together in one unified thread that allows us a deeper understanding of why the Qur'an is still so relevant today and how we can apply the Qur'an to our daily lives. Seen in both children and adults alike, this is a proven method of learning the divine text, connecting us to the Qur'an in a way rarely experienced before. Try Q-Bytes and join us on a journey of discovering the Qur'an. So we will let you know when the app is out because it just makes life easier. At the moment, every morning it's trying to upload onto 16 WhatsApp groups and trying to work this out, but we'll let you know. Okay, so I'm going to start with that verse. This is a verse from Surah Al-Qamar, Surah number 54. And he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ وَلَقَدْ Indeed. يَسَّرْنَا We have made it so easy for you to internalize the Qur'an. فَحَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِ Now if you know even a little bit of Arabic, you know remembrance is dhikr. You know that, right? We call somebody who sits on the member a zakir or zakira. It's actually zakir or zakira. Za is difficult to pronounce. Now, in Arabic, if you know a little bit of Arabic, you know that the easier to pronounce a word, the easier that act is. So Allah does not say muddakir, or He doesn't say muddakir, He says muddakir. So, in other words, He's saying, is there anyone who will put a teeny bit of effort? to be able to understand this text. That's what he's saying. And he says that four times, 17, I think it's 23, 33, 40, something like that. But four times in that surah, he tells you and me, will you put a little bit of effort into it? We're so scared of this book, it's crazy. So I'm hoping, and I'm gonna move away a bit, I'm hoping your Quran will look tatty like mine. I'm hoping you will annotate it. I'm hoping you will put pictures in it. I remember as a child, I told you my father died when he was 10, but I remember when I was nine, he was talking to somebody and he said, somebody who is broken has a whole Quran and somebody who is whole inside has a broken Quran. And I remember running to my bedroom, picking up my Quran and thinking, oh my God, goodness this is new so I turned the pages I took the pages I sort of turned them around you can't do much in a day or even in a minute but you try to roll the pages and I went up to my dad and I said me look at my Quran and he looked at me and he smiled and that was my first lesson in this book you, it's got to be a book that it's used that you put a little bit of effort knowing it that somebody wants your Quran that you've got something written at the sides it cannot be pristine. You can have stickers. So guess what sticker I have in 6611? Come on, I'm gonna get you going. It's Rabbi ibn Lee in the Kabait and Fil Jannah. What sticker do I have near there? A house. I'm gonna tell you a story about my student. She was five when I taught, taught her this. She's now married with two children. So when she was five and in class, I said, draw your house in Jannah. So all the children drew their houses in Jannah. She drew a house on a street, and she drew this street, and she put Umi Auntie's house and her house. 
Today she lives at exactly the same doors away that she drew her house in when she was five. I have it framed because I keep some of these things that I know a bit sentimental. I guess you get older, you get more sentimental. But that's what it does. You've got to be able to draw in your head where you want to be. That's what the Quran does. Now there's a methodology we've worked at, or that's the way we do it. This is our two pennies worth. I'm sure you can change it and chop it as you want. The first thing I believe that we need to do is to be able to recite the Quran and recite it as it ought to be read. It's really important. Now my ancestors and probably your ancestors too did a wise thing. Even though they didn't understand the Quran, the first thing they did was to make us recite it. Even if it was in Urdu um, pronunciations, they said Zuad and they said Toy. And they said, say, did they not say that? And if you read to an Arab, they say, oh, what are you doing? It's okay. We'll, we'll get ourselves there. We'll get better. But our ancestors did something good. They made us stick to the Quran. They got a malim in. Did you get a malim in? Somebody at home? Yeah? They made you read it. Even though you didn't understand it, they told you, there is lots of thawab in reading this Quran. Because you cannot experience this book without reading his words. You just cannot. It's got to be his language, it's got to be his words. It's okay, you have a translation near you, you will understand it. But you, you know how beautiful it was when we heard Surah Al-Fajr? My goodness, that, that was just phenomenal. Because when the recitation of Quran comes from the heart, it will hit the heart. When it doesn't, it won't. And it must be in Arabic. So that was Q read. Then Q terminology. My goodness, we've got to familiarize ourselves with this book. So here we go. I know in Urdu you say para. Do you say para? Si para? Is that what you say? That's good. In Arabic it's juzen ajza. Quran wasn't revealed in juzen ajza. It was revealed as 114 surah. One surah, so many surah. We'll call them chapters. It's okay. But it was divided into 30 equal parts for ease of recitation once a month. Then you have manzil or manazil. And if you look at your Qurans at the bottom, it will say which manzil it is. So if you wanted to finish recitation in a year, in a, in a week, you could do it in seven days. Ruku and rukuat. You know those little ains at the side? I think in Urdu you call them makra. Is that what you call them? Come on, you've got to respond a little bit. They've got three numbers on them. One at the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom. So this Quran was sent to Bukhar in Russia. Yeah, Russia. And the Russian ulama over there wanted to finish the recitation of Quran in the Tarawiyah. You know what Tarawiyah is, yes? The Salah that is recited in Ramadan by some Muslims and they finish on the 27th of Ramadan. Yes? How many rakats in Tarawiyah? Help me, come on. 20. 27 times 20, do the math. What is it? 540. Now 558 is the Indian way. But the Russian way was 540. So you will see in the Quran, different Qurans have different rukuat, okay? But anyway, so they wanted to divide it so it was easy for them. And they divided it into sort of loose subject matter. So that's your rukus, okay? Then you obviously you've got surah and surah. You've got 6,236 ayat, 77,807 words. That's not a lot. You probably speak more than that in a week. So the idea is just to know a little bit of the terminology, to get yourself a bit familiar with it. Then we decided that you need to know the names of the chapters. After all, when you and I introduce ourselves to each other, what do we say? My name is so and so. We know somebody by their name. And normally when we ask people, do you know the names of the Surah of the Quran and how they are, um, you know, in what order they are? If I asked you, what was Surah number 50, would you know? And we thought, that's not working. So we tried this system of mnemonics. Mnemonics is a system that the Greek philosophers used to be able to remember their long talks. So using that same thing, we used it on the Quran. And if you sat with me for an hour, I know you're sitting with me for longer, but if you gave me an hour of your time, I can guarantee you whether you are five or whether you are 90, you will know the names of the 114 in order. I, I give you that promise. You've got to be super dumb not to get there, and you're all super smart. So, I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I tried it on my mom first. My mom died two years ago, but I used to go and see mom in Orlando every, um, every month. And the first person I tried this on was mom. 
is to call and say, Mom, do you know this? And we did it in Gujarati as well. Uh, can I go some more, please? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa atil farajah. Now I'm going to imagine or pretend that you don't know the names of the first ten chapters. Are you good with that? I'd like you to close your eyes. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'd like you to close your eyes. And I'd like you first to imagine, whenever you know the number four, you'll think four wives. Okay, I'm not encouraging it. It was on a reducing basis, but we're not going into the ayah. The mo moment you think four, you're going to think four wives, four women. The moment you think seven, you're going to think seven up. I mean, all of you know seven up, don't you? It's not good for you, by the way. You know that. Diet or otherwise. But moment you think seven, you're going to think seven up. Are you good with that? Okay, seven heavens. Think of that if you want. The moment you think 10, think of zero as the belly of the fish and put a Y in it. Who was in the belly of the fish? Yunus. So if I ask you what is surah number four, what will you tell me? Women. What is seven? Up. It doesn't matter if you say up, it's araf, up. Okay? 10 is Yunus. Are you good with that? Right now, the story. So you walked into the IUS building here. Doors opened and you could smell beef burgers. And you thought, oh my God, Zera, who donated those beef burgers? And she said, the family of Imran. And as you walked in, there were these four volunteers. And they led you to seated tables. Not difficult for you to imagine that. Okay? So here we go. Doors opened. You smelt beef burgers. Um, who donated them? Family of Imran. You saw four volunteers who led you to tables. Are you good? You know the first five. Doors opened. Fatiha. Second one. Bakara, third one, Ali Imran, fourth one, Nisa, women, fifth one, Ma'ida. You good with that? That's how easy it is. Okay, now you come to the six to ten. Now downstairs, they smelt the beef burgers as well. Actually, upstairs. I'll put them upstairs. You have another floor upstairs. So upstairs, they smelt the beef burgers as well. So these people came rushing down, or they came rushing up. You good with that? Rushing up or rushing down, but they came from upstairs or they came up, but you know seven is up. Yes? They thought it was spoils of war. They thought it was free for all. But when they realized it was only for the IUS people who had paid for afternoon tea, they did Toba like Yunus. You good? Fatiha, Bakara, Ali Imran, Nisa, Ma'ida. Sixth one, animals. Seventh one, up. Eighth one, spoils of war. Ninth one, Toba. Tenth one, Yunus. Can you see how easy it is? So we devised a system where there were stories for each one. And soon we found that you could do them. I remember a young five-year-old went up to the reciter in Muharram and said, do you know surah number 50? And he said, uh, no, I can look it up. And they said, I know it because it's half, 50, 50% 50 is half. And half rhymes with half. Okay? 16. I'm just going to give you a few more. 16. What is, they call 16 sweet 16, don't they? What is sweet? Honey. honey. Who makes honey? Bees. 16 is bees. Um, if you add 100 women to the four, what sort of number does that become? 104. Gossip. <laughs> These are just methodologies to be able to understand them, okay? Don't, don't ask me which hadith it's in. It's not. Okay? Because that's normally what I get. It's just a methodology to be able to remember those names. And you can devise your own. So that's what we did. And it worked. That's another mnemonic. And that's one that we've illustrated. And it worked with kids. It worked with adults as well. Because we found <coughs> invariably people did not know the names of the 114 chapters. They're all on the website. You can access them. In fact, I think Hugh Bites has them up to 50. They're little podcasts of three or four minutes every day. Um, hopefully when you get the app, we'll be able to sort that out. And then the city. So let me go back. So first we had the Q-read, we had terminology, we had names. And then we decided that we didn't have this overall look at the city. So that was the first city I built. This is a Lego one. This is in my shed, sitting down, and my children said, Mom, you've lost it. This is the menopause, Mom. <laughs> Mom, this means you're becoming a child again. You're playing with Lego. What are you doing in the shed for so long? I said, leave me alone with my Lego. <laughs> and then we took the city. And at workshop, 
We put it in the corridor. Didn't say a word. Just put it in the corridor. So we have children from three and a half to adult class of 90, up to 90. And everybody would ask, what's that? What's that? And suddenly you found there was an interest. And we had a helicopter on Isra, on Surah number 17. And they said, what's that helicopter for? He said, well, it goes up to the heavens. And we had a chair for Qasas, like a throne. Anybody know why we had that? We had a B for 16. Where was, whose throne did Suleiman? Bilqis, right? So we had a fountain near Gother, so on and so forth. So in front of you, you have a map. And then my brother made me this. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I don't know how to thank him, but this is the sort of stuff that we've been doing for a long time. So let's talk about the city, and you have a map in front of you. So if you can turn to that, can I have a salat, please? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, ali Muhammad. This is how the Lego buildings were, but you've got to imagine that they are, they are buildings here. So I'm going to talk about Quran City. Quran City will never grow, it'll never downsize. It will always have 114 buildings. The length of the buildings is according to the length of the number of verses in that building. So the tallest building is Bakara, and the shortest is, help me, Asar and Gauthar. Okay, that's how it works. Um, there are 86 Maki and 28 Madani buildings. So the Maki ones we put with yellow roofs, and the Madani ones with green, simply because the Prophet's dome is green, and the, the embroidery on the Kaaba is yellow. There's no secret there. The 86 generally talk about the why of religion. The Tawheed, which is reaching your full potential with divinity. The guidance to reach your full potential, which is your prophets and your imams and the book. And finally, accountability, which is what you call Qiyama. Most of you, I, I presume, when you went to Madrasa, they told you the Usul al five. Tawheed, Adala, Nabuwa, Imama. Qiyama. So Tawheed and Adala go together. The only reason we separated Adala was because with other schools of thought, their concept of Adala was different, so we wanted to highlight it. Guidance was the prophets and the imams, and finally accountability. So in essence, it's Tawheed. It is, in other words, reaching your full potential with Allah. You've got guidance to get there, and then all of this is accountable. There has to be a benchmark. And you'll see there are 86 of those. Yet, in most Muslim societies, the first thing we teach our children is the how of religion. We forget to emphasize the why. And I feel that is where the problem lies. If we do not pray, if we do not fast, it's because we haven't understood why. I find it extremely difficult to explain to someone that I pray without understanding what I'm saying. I just cannot fathom that. I tell children, a friend of yours came home, it's time for salah, and you say, excuse me, I have to go and pray. And they say, can I watch you? Yeah, of course you can. So they sit and they watch you. And they say, what are you saying? I don't know. <coughs> oh, why are you doing that? I don't know. I, mean, I wouldn't want to be a Muslim. I just wouldn't. Because I don't understand what I'm doing. I come to the mosque and there's, in my language, in Kachi, we say, we pare and pare and pare. We read and we read and we read and we read. What are you reading? Don't know. My goodness. We have a time limit at Stanmore. You cannot read it in 25 minutes, you don't get the microphone. Are you serious? So, so these are sort of things that are important. So here are 86. And then we looked at the morphology of Medina, how the Prophet created Medina. Okay? So these suburbs were done with the morphology of Medina. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all of them. You can go through the website to see them. But I've got a Quran city center. The Quran city center has got four chapters which relate to the Quran. There's Furqan, which is who you become if you follow divine guidance and who you are if you don't. There is Alak, which are the first five ayats were revealed. That is how. Qadr is when the Quran was revealed, and Bayina is what the Quran is about. If you look at this, I'm going to take you very quickly through it. Um, the yellow section, you know, the divine center, the Hamidat and the Musabbihat is basically a Tawheed. Then you go into guidance where you've got Muhammad Square and the city center. And then right at the top, you've got Qiyama Close, which is your accountability. In the four corners, we've got the naughty corner, which we've put exile corner. Can you see that? 
to come out of exile corner, you have to go to Toba turn. Can you see that? Yeah. There's a woman's corner, which is pink. There's a Qul corner. There are five chapters that begin with Qul. There's a Kaaba corner. Can you see the healthy zone? My favorite is the comfort zone. I mean, Duha and Inshira, I absolutely adore. You know, these were sent to the Prophet when life was really difficult. You can imagine, you know, there's a period of time when there's no revelation. And everybody said, oh, so your God has forsaken you. See, you don't even know how to speak anymore. Especially Umm Jamila, who was Abu Lahab's wife. She's like a power couple, posh and becks of Makkah. Okay. So here's her with a red necklace, her, you know, she was really pretty as well, really intelligent as well. She had virtually everything that you could call success in that part of the world. And she taunted him like nobody's business. He was really, really sad. On top of that, he thinks people who are intelligent may listen to me. So he goes to Ta'if, which is where the Makans had their holiday homes, but they pelted him out as well. So in your minds, close your eyes. Imagine being taunted by everybody in town. Imagine going to people who are intelligent and they don't get it as well. And then imagine broken completely. You sit down under a tree and you wonder, what am I doing wrong? And a little guy called Adas comes. And he looks at the Prophet's swollen feet and bleeding feet. And he kisses them and he wipes them and he gives, them some, and he gives him some grapes. And these are the revelations that come. And when you feel broken, when you feel there's nobody around, I mean, read the Hain and Shira. It's phenomenal. So that's my favorite place. That's why I call it comfort zone. Um, you've got Huruful Muqatti'at. These are all the chapters that start with like secret stuffs. They're really cute. Um, I don't know what else to say to you. Carmel Close, Last Ayah, Victory Circle. There's an energy zone, that's Surah Al-Nur, because every, every city needs an energy. And then you've got the road network, and we call this road network M14. You get it, don't you? Masumin 14. You cannot access any of these without the Masumin. None of these suburbs are accessible. So we try to include that. We also have um, lamps, 99 of them, street lamps. 99, come on, we call it A99. There you go, they are small. Hosna. We enclosed the city in, a, in sort of a, if you can call it, a wall, which had 17 gates. Please. 17. 17 rakahs of Salah. You can only experience Qur'an in Salah. And the idea to be able to learn and recite it in Salah is phenomenal. Okay, so that's basic overview of what this was about. That was your Qur'an city, you have that. The gates say Iqra. That word, that one order, that's the first order to humanity in the Qur'an. That changed a whole people, a whole people. These people did know nothing about the Qur'an or humanity. But that one word, and I tell children, you've got five fingers. Read, internalize, understand, apply, and teach. You cannot just read and read. This book is too beautiful to be just read. It's not inanimate. It responds to you. If you don't approach it with intellectual humility, and you don't approach it like you want to, it'll shut itself off from you. Don't read and read and read and read. Just read one bit, understand it, and then move on. It doesn't matter. The angel of death said, what did you do? I only learned Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's enough. Well, it's not enough. But at least it's a start. Rather than just read and read and go throughout my life, like that software license, I agree, and then forget it. Don't let anybody kid you that it's OK just to read, that it was only for the ulama, that they were the ones who will understand it. Quran says, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدلل متقين. It didn't say هدلل ulama. Yes, we learn from them. They are our teachers. But it says, this book is guidance for those who are God conscious. If you and I believe in him, this is for you and me. Don't let anybody fool you otherwise. This is what happens with the Roman Catholics. You know that, don't you? So the Roman Catholics used to have one big Bible in church. You weren't allowed to have Bibles at home. This is a generalization. The Protestants protested because they wanted to be able to study the Quran at, or the Bible at home. That's why they're called Protestants. And they fought this. But we're turning towards that. 
Okay, so hopefully we won't be there. So Ikra, going very quickly, that's your road network. So let's start. We're going to converse with divinity. Okay, I'm going to take you through two of the buildings, and then I might give you a bit of a break, because you're looking at me thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so there is no Muslim that doesn't know Surat al-Fatiha. Am I right here? Yeah. Yes? You're all good with it. You have, I mean, that is probably one of the most beautiful walls I've seen there, the gift of Fatiha. And I will try and explain to you why it is so important, why that gift is so important. You know, my ancestors, I'm not sure, I don't know about yours, but I'm a Koja. Any Kojas here? Come on, I need some solidarity. Thanks, Lera. Okay. So my ancestors, when they gave you food after a majlis, majlis al Hussain, they called it Fatiha. Have you heard that? It's Tabarruk. It's not Fatiha. But they called it Fatiha. The reason why they did that is so that every time I saw food in my hands, I would read Suratul Fatiha. And if because of that Fatiha, there was a minor change in me, then that reward will go for the person I read Fatiha for. It wasn't just, you know, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me, um, and I'm talking about the kids I see. It, when you say pray, they go, You serious? Don't do the mustahabat. Just read the wajibat, but understand it. So we're going to do Surat al Fatiha. Surat al Fatiha is, in essence, in a nutshell, the Quran. It's the concept of the Quran. Okay? So I'm going to do it in my words. Um, I hope you understand it. So every building we've done like this. Divide Surat al Fatiha into three parts. You good with that? Three parts. First part. You realized you needed a God in your life, so you went shopping. You good with that? Shopping. When I say shopping, you went on the internet, you Googled Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism, all these. And you wanted to find out the concept of a God. You needed a God. You needed some spirituality in your life. And suddenly you came to the Qur'an. And it told you that this God had four major qualities. He was Rabb, he was Rahman, he was Rahim, and he was Malik or Malik. You good with that? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Hamd, by the way, is not praise, it's praise and gratitude. But we're not going into the surah. So the, you went shopping, this God had four, and you thought, let me find out what that means. Rabb may be a master. But it's also a nourisher, a cherisher. But maybe the translation I like is someone who will take you by your hand and take you to your full potential step by step if you let him. Again, a story. So there's this little girl whose doll is broken. She goes to mom and she says, my doll is broken. And mom says, take her to the doll hospital. And she does. But she comes back with a broken doll. And mom is really angry now. So she rushes to the doll hospital and she tells the doctors there, what's wrong with you? My <laughs> child brings a doll and you don't mend it. And the doctors say, we can't do anything because she won't let go. When you are an abd and there is a rub, you must let go of what you think life is about. You must trust him to tell you what is right and what is wrong. And that's hard. That's really hard because it gave you and me free will. But the free will was there to be able to recognize him as the rub. Okay? The, there's a wonderful hadith of Imam Sadiq where he says, when people see us, they see divinity. When they see you, they should be able to see us. You know, I, there's a beautiful song that, and I don't know, are you allowed to? I was going to say it anyway. The beautiful Hindi song which says, Tujme Rab Dikta Hai. You know it, don't you? Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> the idea is for people to be able to see God in you, divinity in you, where you reflect. Because the Prophet said, Taqalluku bi akhlaqil la. Adopt in yourself the akhlaq of Allah. So it's really important that, you know, that, that's how they're drawn to you. So here we go, Rab. You've got to be a reflection of him. He's Rahman and Rahim. And that's what you recite in Bismillah Rahman and Rahim. I will go there in a minute. Rahman, in essence, is 
he is expansive in his mercy. But it's immediate, it's um, urgent, it may be sometimes temporal, but he's Rahman. Rahim is constant, Rahim is particular. That means Rahim is for a particular group, Rahman is for all. The way I explain to children is when you have a toothache, where do you go? <laughs> dentist, okay. So you go to the dentist, and that's where Rahmaniya comes in. Because he will deal with your toothache, and you will tell him, you know what, take this tooth out, but just take the pain away. That is Rahman. If you are intelligent enough after that experience, or even before that experience, you will book yourself with a hygienist every few months. That is Rahim. And only a sp particular group will do that. They're the only ones who will look after their teeth. So Rahman, dentist, Rahim, hygienist. It's a very loose translation for kids. But basically, Rahman is immediate. Rahman is for all. Maybe it's like A&E. A&E is for all, right? You walk in, you're looked after. Rahim, when you want to have a full body checkup, if you want to make sure you're all right, you know, you've got to make an effort to do that. You've got to spend your money to do that. That's Rahim. And then Malik or Malik. So this Allah who is your Rabb, who is Rahman and Rahim, he is the master of the day of judgment or the owner of the day of judgment. He's the one you're answerable to. I mean, why would I want anybody else? The one who is so merciful that he's 70 times more merciful than a mom. Never believe anybody who tells you he's harsh. He is not. I mean, that's a load of baloney that they're scaring you with. Because they tell me the God of Christianity is love, the God of Islam is hate. Are you serious? That's not true. You've been led in a different way. Okay. If you are told, and I am told, that with everything begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim my goodness. His mercy way extends over his justice. Keep that in mind. And it will only reflect in the way I reflect towards others. So he's, again, Rab, come on, don't go to sleep. Rahman, Rahim, and Malik. So now you've looked at these four aspects. You thought, oh my goodness, I definitely want you. So the first section is who. So now the second section. Iyake na'budu wa iyake you and you alone do I want to do we want to be attached to we want to be your slaves and you have realized here that going alone is not gonna work you need people around you it's community can you imagine being alone in Jannah I mean God Almighty it's gonna be boring just imagine for a minute all alone in Jannah all yours really what are you gonna do no I have a friend. She's 89. I just spoke to her about a, about a few hours ago because I said, I'm going to talk about you. So I'll call her Fatima. Her name's not Fatima. So Auntie Fatima um, lives a distance away. And Auntie Fatima used to drive all the way to classes. And I visit her now because she can't drive anymore. So I remember the first time I went to visit her. And I went, oh my goodness. You know, at the moment I stay in, in this. Um, or I, last night I stayed in Oddfellows in the park, right? And there's a long drive that goes up to the hotel. That's Auntie Fatma's house. So I drove up this long drive and I thought, oh my goodness, you, know, you get a bit nervous. Okay, I, it's all right. So we got there and Auntie Fatma lives in one room on the bottom floor. She said, would you like to see my top floor? And I said, um, not particularly, but if you insist, yeah. So she said, that's the Afghani room, and that's the Turkish room, and that's the, and every room had a theme, the Japanese room, and, and they were all empty. And I said, um, Auntie Fatma, why, why do you live in this house? She said, sentimental reasons. I've raised my kids here, but it's horrible living on my own. And that's when you sat down and you thought, and there's nothing against Auntie Fatma, okay? I love her to bits. I still don't understand why she doesn't want to downsize. So you imagine that's her Jannah, is it not? Yes? Everything you and I may have thought of Jannah was about, that's probably what it is. But it's lonely. So that's why you say, Iyake na'abudu, and that's where Asr comes in. You want to go together, Iyake na'abudu, wa Iyake nasta'in. And you and you alone do we ask for help. It's the ana, it's something you are striving for. You know Nasr is help. We just read Suratun 
Nasr. But isti'ana is a word in Arabic where you are doing something and you need help. I am striving to be godlike. We are striving to be godlike. So when you say So the angels come out and say, What do you need help in? So you say, You've got to imagine the angels are there. You've got to. Um, I grew, grew up, like I told you, in, uh, in, in Moshi, it's a small town. But we had the biggest house in the, in the, um, in the town. It was about 18 bedrooms. I remember one day, I used to leave, love Enid Blyton. Any of you read Enid Blyton? Oh, thank God for that. Okay, I feel old when I say it. And I remember one day, I had to finish this. Famous Five, you know that, don't you? Yeah? I had to finish it. And it was time for Zohar. And I laid out my musalla, but I had to finish the book. And I lived in a household where we prayed and then we ate lunch. So I must have been five or six, not more than that. And I remember laying out my musalla, messing up my, you know, you wear the white, what do you call it, janamas, chadar, whatever you call it, messing it up a bit. And I was pretty smart, I think, at that time. So I made this, um, this from the bathroom to my bedroom because we had these terrazzo floors you could tell somebody's walked by the wet marks right i made those wet marks as well but i read my book and when i went downstairs my papa said um i expect uh, I, have you all prayed i didn't answer because at five or six you don't know how to lie you really don't i didn't say anything the next day my dad brought two brooches he commissioned them he didn't tell me anything he put one on my left shoulder and one on my right shoulder, and he said, these are the two angels that reside on your shoulders. Don't worry about the right one, because the right one records everything you do that is good. The left one, talk to him or her every single day. And just say, if you do something not right, just say, wait, don't write, I'll put it right. I, I didn't know why, what, which, when. Many, many years later, I was married with children, when my mother said, do you know why he put those angels on your shoulder? I said, no. He loved me, obviously. So she said, he saw you. He saw you read that book. And he saw that you hadn't prayed, but he didn't say anything. He just brought you those two angels. So those angels will ask you when you say, What do you want help in? So you say, Guide us to our full potential. Sirat, there's only one. There's no plural. Anybody who speaks Arabic will know that. Mustaqim is down to up. It is wide. It is smooth. It allows everybody on it. But every time you pray, you're saying, I want to be my best. And I'm sure those angels ask you, what is your best? What do you want to be? Surely you're not reading it like this. You can't. You've got to think about it. In the third section, he answers you. Beautiful, immediate answer. Surat al ladina an amta alayhim. Ghayr al maqdubi alayhim walaf wali. Now, those two are nouns. The first one is a verb. An amta alayhim, past tense. The path, if you want to be successful, he says, you want to reach your full potential, follow the path of those whom he has blessed. Not those on whom there is anger. He doesn't say my anger. He just says general anger. Not those who are lost. So your question will be, who are those you have blessed? Right or wrong? Agreed or not? So he says, easy. Read the rest of my Quran. So I'm going to take you to the most difficult surah, which everybody doesn't like to read. They don't like to read Surah Al-Baqarah because it's the longest surah in the Quran. I remember somebody once asking me and saying um, she had a constant headache. And she said, what do I read? I said, Surah Al-Baqarah. She said, that's just going to kill it. <laughs> okay. So my grandmother, she was a phenomenal woman. And um, in the fridge at home, she had 114 bottles. And each of those bottles had one surah of the Quran on them. So if we had a tummy ache, she would say, pick 111. You know what 111 is, right? Imagine flames, like three flames. What is flame? Lahab. She would say, pick 111, add it to some water, and then take dawa as well. Dawa and dua. Not just that water. You've got to do both together. 
So she did that for all of those. And they were in the fridge, and I still see them. And I still imagine one day we will try and do that and do 114 test tubes and be able to sell them and all the rest of it. It's for IUS, Manchester. Okay. All right. So, Surah Al-Baqarah. Longest surah, most difficult, right? Let's make it easy. So, Surah Al-Baqarah, a university. So you came out saying, how do I reach my full potential? He said, let's go to school. Divided into nine sections. Are you good with that? Cat has nine lives. You good with nine? Okay. First section. You go to the university and he says, put yourself into a class. Either you believe or you don't believe or you pretend to believe. Yes? Pretend to believe is a munafik. You know that? One who says something else and think something else. So he doesn't say he's going to put you in that class. In this university, he tells you the IR numbers are on the building. I will share the presentation with you. You can go on the website. It has it all on there. So first section, either you're a believer or you are an unbeliever or you pretend. And if you look at that part of, the, of Surah Al-Baqarah, the part of hypocrisy is the longest because it's quite difficult to. Prophet said, he's scared. And he's told the companions, I'm really worried about you. And they said, um, why? And he said, I'm scared of hypocrisy because it will enter you like a black ant on a black rock on a black night. Are you good with the first section? Second section, he says, this is me. So he talks about himself. Third section, you can read it up there. He says, this is my first student. Who was the first student? Adam. وَعَلَّمَ Adama asma كُلَّهَا That whole story is there. That's my first student. Next section, fourth one. These are my challenging students. To the kids, I say my naughty students. A major part of Baqarah is on the naughty students. Who are they? Bani Israel. We're very similar. The Prophet said that my Ummah and the Ummah of the Bani Israel are the right and le uh, left um, champals or right and left sandals, right? So that's my naughty students as such. Then he says, this was my star student. Who was the star student? Come on. Ibrahim. So now you've learned the history of that university. He says, now I'm going to inaugurate you as a new, new nation. And he changes Qibla for you and me. So the eye of Qibla comes here. So now we've got a new class in this university. Next section, all the things you have to learn. He says, not enough. Because you only get a BSc. You want a master's? You need to learn how to invest in the Akhirah. And you will find the next section is about that. And finally, the last section is a CPD. Amana Rasul, you all know that. It's like a continuous program of development where you're learning about what you've done that. And in essence, you know now Surah Al-Baqarah. You good with that? And really, that's your key concepts. That's how you start. I know you're all getting a bit fidgety, but I'm going to try and go through this. I'm not going to do city center because that's four surahs, and you're going to look at me thinking, oh my goodness. But this is something I think you should do. I call it journaling the Quran. So that's my Quran. And this is what you do. You write in it. Um, do you like stationery? Great. Go buy yourself some highlighters, some stickers, some post-it notes, and start journaling the Quran. So that book is on the website. You can download it as a PDF. Um, but start doing that. And on Qbytes, we've done the whole lot, whether it's Ya Yuhannas, we started off with our people, to all you who believe, to the du'as in the Quran, and we continually do this. That's Ayatul Kursi, which you all know. I love this. Why do you read so many salawats? Inna Allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhalladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Can we have a salawat? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. So, 3356. You know what? There's not much you and I do that God does. We don't. The creator and the created are so different. This is one place where we do what God does. Because he says, Inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. When you are reciting salawat, you are doing what God and the angels do. It's the only place that we do this. So when you're stuck in life and you've forgotten du'a and inshira, just recite salawat. Keep on reciting it. <coughs> Scared, anything, angry, whatever it is, recite salawat. 
Somebody's ill, recite it in water, give it to them. You recite it. Just keep on doing it. It's phenomenal. 3333, 33, you all know, don't you? Inna ma so these are just bits that you need to highlight. I'm going to ask you one that's not on here. What about 555? I'll go into that in a minute. What is 555? Anybody know? Uh, okay, I can't draw on anything. So if I drew you a ring with a red stone, and in the stone I drew a person in Ruku and I wrote 555, what would you tell me? As Imam Ali giving his ring in, Ruku. And you remember such numbers. And it's empowering because it's the book of God. But I'd like to end today with that. I love that. Absolutely adore it. So Allah talks about Bitana, friends. Do you want to turn to your, I'm sure you've got it on your, um, on your phones. Go to Al Imran 118 because you won't be able to see that. So we're going to read this together, okay? Because I can't leave here without this. So he says, Ya you Ladina Amanu. Maybe you can read it from up there. Ya you Ladina Amanu. Or you will believe. La tatakhidu bitanatam min dunikum la ya'lunakum khabala. What does it say? Don't take bitana friends from anybody else but yourselves. It doesn't say don't be friends with others. It's just talking about bitana friends. I talk about what bitana friends is. Normally in the English language, if you're a belly friend, it means two people are pregnant at the same time and they're belly friends. This is different. A bitana person is somebody who is able to keep your secrets. They do not regurgitate them. And a bitana friend feeds you in your button, looks after you, and nourishes you. So he says, when you want a friend like that, who nourishes you emotionally, spiritually, physically, and mentally, then pick those who are your own. And I call them Ahlul Baytis. So I'd like to leave with asking you if you will be my Bitana friends. So if you learn just one, one word of the Quran and you use it in your daily, daily life, that's what it's all about. So let me just end with something else. If I were to tell you you're all 53s, what am I saying? Look at your look at the look at the um, Quran city. Find 53. If I said you're all 53s, what would you say? Stars. If I said I 36 you. <laughs> what is 36? 36 is through to Yasin, and Yasin is the heart of the Quran. Valentine's coming up. There you go, I 36 you. If I say, please never be 80s, what does that mean? And it's an exiled corner. Please never frown, okay? So you could use numbers, you could use names. If you start incorporating the Quran in your daily life, it has its own magical effect. It has a divine effect on you. So I'd like to end, because I think I've spoken too much, um, with hopefully you learning this somehow, in whatever way you can. This is one methodology. I'm sure everybody has lots of different methodologies. Um, I hope you will subscribe to Qbytes at some point. Um, it should be launched in the next month or so. We're still developing the app at the moment. And I hope you will be all part of this journey where we learn about the Quran. And thank you very much for listening. Jazakumullah khair. I have one more thing that I always end with. I don't know whether you know it, but do you know Lee Khamsatun or not? You do? Please, will you? I will still say sing it. Please sing it with me. I won't lie and say recite, because I recite Quran, I sing this. Okay. لي خمسة عطفي بها حر الوباء الحاتمة المستفى والمرتضى وأبناهما والفاطمة. Can you do it again with me? لي خمسة عطفي بها حر الوباء الحاتمة المستفى والمرتضى 
وأبناهما والفاطمة جزاك الله خير